The following is a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club. It was round five of the Summer Classic here in St. Louis. While Akobian and Durabaili was the key matchup, the pair agreed to a draw before our show went to air. Vasif's winning streak is over. Every other Group A showdown was decisive, including Alexander Injic handing Sam Sevian his first defeat. Group B's standings changed only slightly, since the only win came from Josh Friedel over Sadua Kosova. Friedel enters a five-way logjam for second place. Coverage of round six starts now. 20 international chess professionals compete in St. Louis as USChessChamps.com presents the first ever Summer Chess Classic. Hello everyone, welcome to the St. Louis Chess Club studio and the round six of 2018 Summer Chess Classic. I am Women Grandmaster Katarina Nemtsova and I am joined by International Master Eric Rosen. Now we have many interesting games going on right now, but yesterday was a very decisive uh, day for Group A, so let's review yesterday's results. That's right, we had a very bloody day yesterday in Group A. Four decisive games, Benjamin Bach, Alexander Injic, Jeffrey Zhang and Renat Jumabayev all winning their games. The two leaders of, of Group A, Varakobian and Vasif Durabeli, agreed to a relatively peaceful draw. And this brings us to standings. And we can see Vasif Durabeli still in clear first, four and a half out of five points. That's a very strong start given it's such a strong field. Exactly. And what happened in Group B yesterday? We had many results uh, resulting in draw. Only Josh Friedel won against Dinara Saduakasova, and all other players agreed on draw. Now the, the statings did not change too much. We still have the leader, Polish Grandmaster Kamil Dragon, with three and a half points out of five, and five-way tie for the second place, where JJ Ali Marandi, Sergei Matsenko, Josh Friedel, Alejandro Ramirez, and Andrei Stukopin all have three points. And let's take a look at the tournament format. We have two groups, of course, two 10-player round robins with a time control of 90 minutes for 40 moves, plus 30 minutes for the, for the remainder of the game, and of course, a 30-second increment starting from move one. And let's remember that players are not allowed to agree on a draw before move 30. This brings us to schedule. We have all rounds starting at 1 p.m. Central Time, only the last round starts at 11 a.m. Now if there, is a if there is a tie for the first spot, players will have a playoff starting at 5 p.m. And let's take a look at the pairings for today in Group A. We have a bunch of exciting matchups. Benjamin Bach against tournament leader Vasif Darabeli, Peter Perhaska against Veruja Nakobian, Yaro Zherebuk against Renat Chumabayev. The two youngsters in the field, Sam Sevian playing Jeffrey Zhang, that's already uh, a matchup which is heating up. And Daniel Friedman drawing uh, Alexander Injic in what was a very quick game. And board one is our key matchup. Benjamin Bogg against Vasif Dorabaili. Vasif only having a draw yesterday, otherwise perfect score. Benjamin Bogg scoring a first point yesterday. So let's glance at the board, let's glance at the board and see what's happening. Yeah, and I have to say this game is a bit reminiscent of Asif's game against Veruja Nakobian. It seemed like what well, was a, a relatively drawish opening, but if we take a look at the current position, uh, White is up a pawn, so maybe there's something for Benjamin to play for. Do you think uh, any winning chances for White, Katarina? Now, it looks always promising to have some material up, but we have to think how White can continue, how the king can help maybe the pawn to promote I think it's not that easy for White to find the way for the king to get to the queen side, uh, noting that you know we have a double pawn there, and uh, we also have to be careful about not losing all the pawns on the king side. That's right, and I like what Vasif has done, putting the rook on a very active square a3. Not only is it defending against uh, the past a pawn, but it's also creating some issues for White along uh, along the ranks. Uh, we might see a potential move like rook a2. Uh, cutting the white king off completely and I was actually joking earlier that maybe black has a mating idea with uh, with simply pushing the pawns pawn e5 pawn h5 and if black gets maybe five moves in a row it could end in checkmate yes but unfortunately probably there are no five moves in a row for black um, we will go back to this game to see what's happening but let's see what about group b what is their pairings 
We already have a result for the game Dinara Sadoakasova, who won against Alejandro Ramirez, and there is a draw between Sergei Matsenko and Andrei Stukopin. Kamel Dragon is still playing JJ Ali Marandi, Tatev Abrahamian is playing with Vladimir Belos, and Josh Friedel is playing against Robert Agasarian. And the key matchup of today is tournament leader of Group B, Camille Dragon, against JJ Ali Mirandi, who has not lost a game. We should note, actually, either neither of these players have lost a game so far this tournament. So we're probably going to expect a very, uh, very hard-fought battle. So let's see what's happening there. Yeah, we can see JJ thinking with, uh, with Camille away from the board currently. Uh, if we take a look at the current position, it seems like both sides have very ugly and, and bizarre pawn structure. Yes, before we were saying how the bishop on d7 is kind of useless, not having anything to do, but suddenly maybe it has the open diagonal, it can do something. What do you, th what do you think, Eric, about the pawns on d3, e2, f4? I mean, they are center pawns, and sometimes, I mean, you, you do want to control the center in chess, so white, has, white does have more potential to control the center. We might see some central advance. I think this last move that was played, bishop to c1, not only is it defending the pawn on b2, but perhaps it's getting ready for some center lunge, like pawn e4 and perhaps pawn f5. And I do like what, uh, what Camille is doing in this position, going for the expansion, and maybe white is the one playing for some advantage here. I have to agree, and Kamil is the leader, so he wants to win the tournament. Let's see what are the prizes, what the players are fighting for. That's right, we have a very generous prize fund for Group A, $22,000 up for grabs with a $6,000 first place prize. Lots of money on the line. Absolutely, and Group B also has a big prize fund, the total of $40,000, and the first prize is $4,000. Right, so lots of money to play for. I'm sure, especially towards the end of the tournament, players will be fighting for every single half point. I agree. So let's see what is happening, maybe in tournament A. Yeah, there's a, actually a really interesting position between Sam Sevian and Jeffrey Zhang. Um, I do want to go back and show the opening just because it was so unusual. Um, Sevian is sometimes known for being a bit creative in the opening. And this game, he, he really showed his creativity. We had what started as a, uh, a close Sicilian, knight c3 Sicilian, which is one of my favorite openings to play as white. But then we see the very unusual pawn d4, which is maybe combining ideas of the open Sicilian and close Sicilian. Usually we see uh, white preparing d4 with a move like knight f3. But in this case, after pawn take d4, queen take d4, um, it's a bit unusual for white to bring out the queen so early. Yes, and what's even more unusual is this, this is the following idea that Sam Savian decided to play. B3, I mean, have you ever played B3 in such an opening, Eric? I mean, I'm, I'm not the type of player to play B3. I like more uh, classical and kind of uh, uh, the standard chess. Um, but I, I do have to admire the idea, which, uh, I mean, it's, it's very simple. Play bishop b2 and have some scope along the long diagonal. If we do see how the game developed after queen d2, uh, Jeffrey appears to have employed somewhat of a dragon setup with bishop g7. So we can see from the very beginning a lot of tension between the two dark squared bishops. And what happened in the middle game, black castle kingside, which leads us to position with opposite side castling, which, as we've seen from previous games, these positions can be very, very sharp and tactical. And uh, we need to know that Jeffrey is a very active player, very strong grandmaster. Maybe Sam Savian just wanted to play something different, something offshore that's not trendy now. That's true. I mean, it's not a bad strategy to, uh, to have some surprise value in the opening, even if it's not the... Uh, the most reliable line if you can get your opponent out of their comfort zone, especially someone like Jeffrey, who's very well prepared in the opening. So what if we fast forward to the current position? Yeah, a lot of craziness happened. Uh, we should note this, this pawn sacrifice, pawn a4, uh, which actually turned into an exchange sacrifice. Knight take a4 was met with rook take a4, trying to just bust open the, uh, the queen side. Uh, so Jeffrey seems to be going all out for a win here. He played queen b6, and we can see the king on b1, not the safest of pieces with both the queen on b6 and still this bishop on b7. It appeared the threat was, uh, was a very venomous knight take e4 here, which would threaten both mate and the queen on d2. So I like the way Sam responded with bishop b5, just creating a post for the bishop. And then uh, he reinforced the bishop with c4. 
the idea of c4 is reinforcing the bishop on b5, but also maybe the queen defending the b2, so there's no issue happening with the diagonal and the bishop on g7 maybe attacking it in future. That's right, and now it's going to be up to Jeffrey if he can actually prove compensation for sacking the exchange. Knight e8 doesn't seem like the most impressive move in the position. And let's zoom forward to the current position, Sam uh, optimizing his pieces. Queen c3 and bishop on d4. I do like the setup from White. The bishops do get traded on b5. And actually, Sam got to fix his pawn structure, so no more double a pawns for White. But knight takes c4 was played, and bishop takes g7. Brings us to the current position where it seems like Black should probably recapture with the knight. Uh, any thoughts about this, Katarina? The situation is always tricky when the king is exposed, knight on c4, there is some cooperation with the rook, like rook a3 coming up, maybe the knight from f6 to d7. Uh, what is happening here? I mean, black has to recapture with knight. I don't I see I mean, it. we can see Jeffrey is taking his time. Uh, Sam is not at the board, so maybe knight takes g7 isn't the only move that he's considering. Maybe knight a3 intermediate move where we are giving a check and forcing the king to go somewhere. Yeah, knight a3, definitely one possibility. I was actually thinking about rook a3 too. Why not uh, improve the rook, attack the queen? Um, so it seems like some interesting op options for Jeffrey, and it might be, might be a little bit dangerous for white given that there is not much shelter around the white king, and black has some decent potential to attack. And we also need to note that Jeffrey only has 12 minutes for 20 more moves to make. That's a really good point, and it's not, uh, it's not easy being low on time when the position is getting very complicated. So maybe this goes back to Sam's opening strategy where he wanted to make Jeffrey use a lot of time at the beginning of the game so it, he would have more time for uh, some later complex situation. I agree, and I like White's position. I think it's still very solid, and we are exchange up. Black has to prove that there is something for, for the exchange. That's very true. So let's keep an eye on this game, but let's move on to another battle taking place. Um, a game that was catching my eye but just ended in a draw is the fight between Daniel Fridman and Alexander Injic. We were taking a look at this game earlier and it seemed like White had some, some sort of pull in the position. Uh, maybe we can go back a few moves and see what happened. Because um, right around here, this move rook c7 on move 21, uh, it seemed like white was completely dominating the c-file, but sometimes positions like this where, the, where there's so much material that's already off the board, it's not easy to, to make progress. Yes, and we also have to know the bishop on e2. I mean, the bishop is so sad. It doesn't have any squares really where to go. Um, if there was a knight, maybe we could jump somewhere around, pick the squares, but the bishop is tied to light squares, and these squares are just blocked by black pawns. That's right. Sometimes when your bishop is on the same color pawns as your opponent, the bishop is just a lot e more easily restricted. In this case, there's not a clear home for the white bishop. Meanwhile, black's bishop, I like uh, controlling the, the b1h7 diagonal. If we go forward to see what happened, white does dominate the c-file with both rooks, but it doesn't seem clear how white actually makes progress in this position, and I do like what Alexander Injic did, just going for the trade of rooks, uh, rook 8 to b7, and it seems like white really can't avoid the trade, and they just went for the perpetual in, in this position. I was actually thinking if, if black is forced to, to go for perpetual, or if maybe black can try to play for, uh, for some advantage, but the issue is that the bishop on g6 cannot be improved. I mean, I wish I could go to d3 and c4, but there is really no space to, to go with the bishop. Yeah, it seems, it seems difficult for, for both sides, and I feel like a, a draw is a very fair result where probably both players are, are happy to have a quick game. Maybe, uh, especially in the later rounds of the tournament, you don't want to be devoting so much energy to every single game. And it's not, not such a bad thing to have a quick game like this. I agree. So what if we go to the tournament B? We thought that maybe Tatev Abrahamian had an advantage against Vladimir Bela. So what is happening there? That's right. That was a very crazy position earlier. Uh, Tatev going for the kingside attack. She did break through with her queen. Uh, let's actually go back to that moment because didn't take a look earlier, but it seemed like she was, uh, she was able to lunge her h-pawn forward on the h-file. Uh, on move 19, she played the, the very standard pawn h5, going for, uh, going for some active play with her rook on h1. f6 was played and queen h6. 
And I do admire the way she's playing. It seems like she's being very resourceful with her pieces. Knight f8, the h-file did open, um, and her knight coming from the other direction uh, onto d5. And it seems like black is the one who is trying to just stay alive in this position. And I have to note that Tep is my friend. She's my teammate from the US Women's Olympic team. So I know she likes aggressive play. She likes to attack. So I think she's very happy with her position. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, it's always nice if you can get a position that really suits your style. And in this case, I mean, Black seems to be almost collapsing. I'm surprised that the game is still going, given that, uh, I mean, it seems like White should have some sort of mating, mating idea here. We should note this nine on F8 doing a, a very nice job keeping, keeping some key squares defended, especially this h7 square, which can't be accessed by the, by the white rook right away. So Tata played the very uh, maybe calm positional king b1, maybe following the advice of Grandmaster Ben Feingold, who says always play king b1, um, especially when you're not sure what to do. So let's move there forward. Is, there is a very nice idea. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of bishop d3, why would love to put the bishop on the a2 ga diagonal so it could attack the king? But the problem is that white has to be also careful about, about her king. So let's say white takes c takes b5. They may be, there may be some issue like knight d4. Mm, and we can see black's counterplay can come very quickly. I really like that idea from black, just going for the, uh, going for the attack along the c file. And of course, white, white's knight is pinned to the c1 square. Knight take d4 would end in the immediate checkmate. So I'm sure Tatev doesn't want to open up too many lines on the side where her opponent, king, uh, where her king is, uh, is currently staying. So that's why she went bishop d3 instead? Yeah, bishop d3 was played, knight e7. Let's get to the current position and try and figure out what, what's happening. The rooks are getting traded, and knight g4 is played. Brings us to the current position where it seems like white has everything to play for, potential for the knight to come to h6. And let's keep in mind the bishop has a very simple maneuver, bishop to c2 and bishop b3, uh, really trying to find the best harmony for white's pieces to attack. Yes, and... Um we have to know that knight on f8 is actually very strong, really defending the king. So I, I, I'm thinking, what if black plays, let's say, queen c6? What if I simply defend the f6 square and now want my rook from a8 to get into play? Yeah, maybe there's not a knockout blow in this position, but I can imagine Tatev will just be happy improving her pieces further. A move like bishop c2, bring the bishop to, to b3, and sometimes if you can't, crush your opponent right away, you just want to keep adding pressure, adding pressure until you, you get that last straw which, uh, which breaks the camel's back. Yes, I agree. So let's, let's move on to the next game. What is the leader of the group B, Camille Dragon, doing with JJ Ali Marandi? The center looks amazing. And this is our key matchup of today. Uh, we, were, we did glance at this game earlier and now we see this pawn expansion. Uh, with pawn e4, I'm sure it looks like white is going for the, the further expansion with pawn f5. And we should note that there are obstacle bishops in this position. So I do like what white is doing, putting the pawns on light squares, making sure that the bishop can find perhaps a better square in this position, and also restricting black's very depressing bishop on d7. And now it's, I mean, it's very difficult here to, to find what to do with black because the pawns are defending all squares and controlling important, uh, important squares. And black doesn't have a way to really go and attack the white king. It doesn't have a way to try to improve maybe his pawns and go for some kind of promotion. I think this is a very difficult situation for JJ. I would not be happy being black in this position. We can see JJ sitting there at the board, Camille Dragon away from the board. That's usually a sign that uh, Camille is probably comfortable here. And this is, a, this is a common idea in chess. If you control the center, if you control a lot of key squares, it's just difficult for the opponent to, to find activity. And sometimes situations like this could cause black to maybe blunder, where it's not entirely clear what to do. Yes, I often tell my students, just put your piece in a, pieces in a good position and then let your opponent make a mistake. And I think we just witnessed something. It looks like JJ did reach out his hand. It looked like he touched his queen, but then he brought his hand back and he's continuing to think. So I have here we might see a touch queen move. e6. Oh, queen e6 was played. Yes. Okay, so maybe there's not uh, too much synchronization here, but queen e6 oh, played. No. It just uh, disappeared, you are correct. It just disappeared. So uh, I wonder if he tricked the DGT board. 
he probably played queen e6, didn't hit the clock, moved the queen back to g6, and then he changed his mind to play queen f7. Uh, queen which f7 we can is see being as a played, position. yes. Uh, you don't see that too often with very strong players making a move, not letting go, and then changing their mind. And it says something about the player, how he feels about the position. I mean, he has 20 minutes, so it's not like he has to decide immediately, but he's still insecure in really deciding, deciding which move to make. That's true. And I usually see this among, uh, among kids where they, they want to reach out their hands and make a move. And I usually tell my students chess is played with the mind and not with the hands. And um, you should really be absolutely sure what you want to move before you even reach out your hand. But even sometimes the top players will, uh, will go against this principle. I agree. So what if we move on to the game of Josh Friedel against Robert Agasarian? I thought Josh made an amazing move with G5, um, claiming some advantage, but I'm not sure if this is the case right now. Right. Uh, let's try and go back and find that uh, find the moment where Josh did play g5. Uh, we see a somewhat imbalanced position where white has just, uh, the, the queens did get traded on a3, leaving white with maybe not the, the happiest pawn structure on the a-file. But if we go forward, a uh, very aggressive move, g5, uh, appears to be a pawn sacrifice. That's a very nice idea that if you, at least I thought that if you take, I can go with something like f6, mm, because the g7 is defending the knight on h6, so we do have to be careful as black of capturing the second pawn. But it did not happen, I wonder why. So Josh actually had a different idea in the position, given the pawn on f6 is no longer, uh, no longer controlling this e5 square, Josh very simply played knight e5, which uh, is a very nice positional move, also comes with a tactical threat perhaps considering rook take h6 followed by knight take f7. So this prompted black to play rook f8. And if we look, uh, Josh is currently down a pawn, but black's pawns on the g-file are quite weak. But what do you think would happen if I played f6 instead of knight e5? Mm, so you're saying f6 may be potentially stronger, or at least another option for white. Um, this does look interesting because uh, the pawn on g7 can't move. I mean, I want to take the pawn or I want just to go for promotion with the pawn. I'm actually curious about this. Maybe a move like rook, rook g8 possible, going for pure defense. But now I have knight e7 possibly. Ah, knight e7, simple fork. Um, I thought yeah. I had saw a very interesting line. So f6, mm -hmm. bishop takes uh, g6. Bishop takes g6, now something like uh, knight, uh, sorry, now... In black's under pressure, the pawn is attacked on g7, the knight under constant eye from the rook on h1. Um, this does not seem pleasant for black. What can... I mean, we have very strong grandmasters and they have... They have a lot of time, I mean, they have 20 minutes, so I'm sure Josh thought about this move F6. What could be another yeah, We should note here? we're not using an engine. This is a type of moment where maybe a, a supercomputer like Stockfish could just spit out an answer, but for us mere humans, we, we have to analyze uh, on our own. Um, so this is maybe a question for Josh after the game, if, if we can get him in the studio. Okay, so let's move on. Let's see what happened in the game. So, so 95 was played. Rook f8, rook g1, going, uh, trying to win back at least one pawn along the g-file. g4 played, and then white did win back the pawn. Black traded off perhaps uh, the passive knight on h6. And let's get for or go forward to the current position. Uh, black bringing the king in and perhaps maneuvering the knight to d6. It is currently Josh's move. And material's equal, but I, I would probably have to favor black in this position just given the, the ugliness of White's pawn structure. And I mean, you, every single pawn is isolated. And especially you will get your Capablanca knight on d6. Yeah, I mean, I've, I think I've mentioned this most days, but uh, in a lot of Queen's Gambit decline positions, this knight coming to d6, just such a nice positional piece, combining very well with Black's pawn structure, controlling a lot of key center squares. And in this case, um, I, I would have to pick Black. I mean, unless there is something we are completely missing, I think black is the one who is pushing for, for advantage here. That's right, and we can see Josh there biting his nails. Seems a bit nervous. 
Yeah. Well, let's see. We will wait what he figures out here, and let's move on. Maybe to to back to tournament A. We didn't see what is Yaro Jarebuk doing uh, in a game against Rinat Jumabayev. Yaro lost yesterday, a tough loss. Uh, Rinat scored his first point. That's right, and we can see. Um, I mean, Rinat seems to have a lot of pressure on the the half open e file, uh, queen e five having just been played, avoiding the queen trade. And I always tell my students, if your opponent's king is less safe, or if you're the one attacking, keep queens on the board. This is exactly what Renat did. And in this position, it seems like uh, there might be some ideas of queen b2 trying to infiltrate uh, white's territory. So Yaro responded with rook c e1, making sure that when queen b2 happen, he happens, he has rook e2. Yeah, that's a nice idea. I do like this move, rook c e1. Um, just making sure the position is held together. There's not too much invasion for black. And I, I would be curious what black is doing next, because it seems like uh, if we just look at black's pieces, they're all on relatively nice squares. And positions like this, you either want to optimize your pieces further or look for some kind of breakthrough, some kind of uh, tactical breakthrough. And it's not clear how black is continuing here. The issue that I see here is that Renat has only 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes for 14 moves. And he just played queen c7, simply retreating the queen to defend the pawn on a5 that is being attacked by the queen. That's right. Actually, we should mention that white was attacking both of these pawns, which were not defended. So queen c7 may be a necessary move. Um, and we can also note that white does have some potential to maybe cause some issues for black in this position. Uh, if we imagine, let's say white goes for maybe the solid rook to e2, and then someday bring the rook to, to the c file to try and, uh, try and create some pressure against this backward c6 pawn. And when we see the knight on f6, we have a perfect pawn on f3 for white, who is blocking this knight on going exactly to d squares g4 and e4. Oh, that's very true. Um, but we should keep in mind that uh, white's rook on h1 is tied down to defending the h2 pawn, so it might take some, some safety moves for white to, to fully defend everything in the position. Uh, we might see rook e2 coming, followed by g3, and then swinging the rook over. And um, I mean, for black, maybe it's a question, you, you do bring up a good point, of, of how the knight can actually get to a better square in the game. And Yarrow has about 20 minutes, so we will let him think. We have a result uh, from Group A where uh, Benjamin Bog drew against uh, Vasiv Dorabaili. That's what we predicted the rook and game, uh, and the game looked kind of drawish. It's true. We can see neither player at the board there, and um, it seemed like White had no way of, uh, of making progress in the position. Uh, the rook on a2 fully cutting off the king on f3, and with this last move, rook g8. Uh, I mean, white's just not making progress after something like king f7. The rook would have to return to a8. This is just a dead draw. Exactly. So let's go to game of Sam Savian against Jeffrey Shong. There is some uh, crazy things happening. Black did not recapture the bishop on g7 uh, and goat went for even more uh, variations that... Uh, wow. Yeah, we I were discussing this position earlier. We assume that knight take g7 should be played. Queen c5 was played, which, we need, which both of us didn't consider. Uh, I'm curious if there is a, a tactical threat with this move. Maybe very simply, uh, queen take b5 uh, is, a, is a threat. So white played rook to d5. And then another counterattack, knight to a3, king a1, and then queen f2 leads us to a very bizarre position with pieces scattered all over the board. I mean, right now, white is rook up. So black has to make sure that there is something. But we have to know that the bishop on g7 is hanging, the knight on e2 is hanging. So most likely, black will be able to get at least one of those um, light pieces. But it still does not look like it should be enough. I mean, I've <laughs> these are positions which I don't like to play. I know Sam Sevian excels in these positions, which are incredibly crazy. And I know that because I played Sam Sevian a few years ago uh, at the Chicago Open, and he destroyed me as, uh, as black in 22 moves. I really had no chance, and that's because he steered the game into a very tactical position, which he was just uh, much better equipped for. Mm -hmm. So what if white plays here something like bishop h6? I like to keep the bishop on board to make sure, I mean, I can give up the knight, but the bishop, I think, is very strong uh, by controlling all the dark squares. 
yeah, the bishop could be effective on h6, controlling the c1, h6 diagonal, and also uh, perhaps paralyzing the knight on e8, given that uh, queen g7 is always something for, for black to worry about in the position. Um, if bishop h6 is played, I think we can expect queen take e2. And then it's a question, can black uh, continue the attack? Uh, there is some pressure against the a2 pawn, given the queen on e2 and the rook on a8, both having some, uh, some target to attack. So if I go something like either rook e2 or rook c1, not sure which one to go. So maybe rook d2 is logical, um, hitting the queen, but this leaves the pawn on b5 hanging. Maybe black can try and scoop up more material. And now I finally go with my rook c1, developing the last piece that didn't make a move in this game. I mean, I'm exchange up. That's very true. White is up the exchange. Uh, if we're counting pawns, we can see black does have one pawn for the exchange. But with queens on the board and such a sharp position and such a lack of safety for the white king, you would think that Jeffrey has at least some compensation. I agree. And we will shortly have a guest in the studio. But let's, before that, let's see what's happening. We didn't see the game between Peter Prohaska and Vara Kobian. That's right, it's somewhat of a, a dry position. Uh, Peter Prohaska, perhaps, uh, I don't know, I, it seems like maybe he's okay accepting a draw here. Um, but white should be having the upper hand here, just given the activity of the rooks, both on b2 and c7. Um, we, we can note the b6 pawn very weak, and white has one very nice pawn island on the king side. Yes, and we always talk about the rook end games and how they are tricky, even if, let's say, white has pawn up. But here, white doesn't have a pawn up. We note that the material is equal. The pawn on b6 looks like it's extra, but white has this pawn, which is still, which is still here, which is the opposite. So material is equal. And now, whenever the black tries to push the pawn, we do have the rook that can go behind the pawn. And now, really, what can black do? How can black advance? We can also know that the king doesn't really have anywhere to help. If the king tries to move somewhere, it cannot go too far away because this rook can always go back and capture this pawn. So we will go back to this game, but we don't think, I don't think neither me or Eric think there's going to be something more interesting than, um, than a draw in a couple of moves. So what else we have here? Let's go to the game of... Um, of the tournament leader because we will have a player of this game. Let me find the game. Here, here we go. So we have Benjamin Bach in the studio. Um, welcome. Very Thank good. You. Very nice game, uh, but very peaceful. Or what can you tell about it? Uh, yeah, so I prepared this uh, line, but <coughs> But I actually didn't know uh, this move, Vasif played bishop f5. So uh, that was a preparation, you think, on Vasif's side? Uh, yeah, because I played a g3 line uh, qu quite often, so he sure had prepared it. He also played quite fast, so mm -hmm. must have been his preparation. So this was the first move that you have to th have had to think. So you just uh, decided yeah. to castle. Yeah, Very okay, natural castle move. looks like a natural move, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, he played knight e4, and yeah, here I I played bishop f4. It looked like a natural move to to me. And okay, the position is symmetrical, but I have one extra tempo. Maybe I can do something uh, with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, he took on c3. Played knight c6. Um, yeah, and here I also considered to to play queen b3. But also not sure if he takes on uh, e5, and if I take back, takes, takes, maybe queen c7. Because I thought if he plays e6, I might have c4. And uh, the problem, the problem is that if he uh, takes on c4, I take on b7, and he always has to watch out for e4 and his bishop can be trapped. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a drawback of playing bishop f5, that yeah. the bishop is no longer defending the b7 square, uh, the b7 pawn, but also it can go into some some troubles, like Benjamin said, maybe e4, where the bishop maybe can get even trapped. Yeah. 
So let's go and back. It, um, mm -hmm. So, okay, I decided to take on c6, but yeah, another position. Okay, yeah. What did you think here? Did you thought you are just going for a draw, or did you try to push for some advantage? Yeah, I tried to push a bit, but um, yeah, Fazif told me that apparently he was still in his preparation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I played rook c1, rook c8, c4, and here bishop e6. Um, yeah, he told me that he was still uh, following in his uh, analysis. It's a very difficult to play a player who, I mean, has such a deep analysis. Uh, what is your like advice to players who are maybe worried about their opponents being very well prepared? Um, well, you shouldn't be too uh, too worried, um, and just uh, be well prepared yourself. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But yeah. Somehow so he just played a line I didn't know. So mm -hmm. Okay, I took on d5. He has to take back because, okay, if he takes with the bishop, I think this position should be quite good for me. I play e3, for example, and I have rook c5 coming next, rook c1. So mm -hmm, because suddenly black has a, a weakness here, and we can yeah. try to, like you said, rook c5, yeah. rook c1, yes. double all the power and try to get the pawn for free. Yes. So that's why you said that's why uh, black took with pawn. Yeah. Okay, and I have to take now on d7. I don't see anything else. Mm -hmm. He takes back, and I thought if I play some move like e3, he plays e6, and I this don't see. This looks like a dead draw, right? Yeah, I don't see how I how I can be better. But okay. So I do you think took. do you think there was like a key moment in this game? Um. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was all correct. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, because he prepared everything and then played. Okay, I think here he had a couple of options. I was a bit surprised by bishop h3. I thought he would take on d4. And here I didn't see how to make use of uh, the bishops on the d-file. For example, if I play rook cd1, he plays e5. And in case of bishop h6, he goes rook fd8, and if bishop g5, rook f8, and I mean, he just makes sure that after e3 he can move the bishop, and if I take on f7, he can take back with the rook. So if, yeah, so there are small tactics, so the yeah. king cannot take because the bishop, but if rook recaptures, yes. everything looks fine. Yes. And um, I thought if I take on c8, maybe he can even take with the bishop, mm -hmm. because I was quite curious how this position was. Let's say I play rook d3, he plays e5, and I don't know, maybe this is nonsense, but okay, I don't know how this, probably it should be equal, but... So you have three pawns for a bishop. Yeah. Mm. yeah it should be a draw, but I don't know who, if if white can be better or not at all. Or mm -hmm. But, and I thought that if he plays bishop b5, this could be inaccurate, inaccurate because of bishop c7. If he takes here, I go rook e1, and maybe some problems. I mean, that's interesting that even though the material is equal, it looks like it's totally equal, totally draw. White can still push some advantage because we see that the uh, rooks are way more active than the black yeah. rooks. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, if my initiative gets slowed down, it, uh, it's of course a draw. But if I can keep something going, I yeah might still have a small advantage. Mm -hmm. and he played bishop h3. And... Yeah, here I didn't see anything better than bishop g2. I thought if I play, for example, rook d1, he takes on c1, I take back with the bishop, he plays... Just to make sure to defend the pawn on d4. Yeah. And he plays rook d8, and in case of e4, he has e6. And if I go something like bishop b3, he takes here. I can try bishop e3, but he takes and plays a6, and it's just a draw. Mm -hmm. So that's why what happened? Bishop g2, yeah. 
And it looked like you just traded material. It went to to an end game, to the rook end game. Yeah, Was there anything to to do in the end game? Well, here I thought I might be a bit better, but I didn't see how. So he took on d4. I think rook d1 is uh, a critical move. Mm -hmm. Played bishop b6. I thought if he takes here, I can. Okay, maybe I can also. Okay, I thought if I take with the bishop, and he plays, let's say, rook c8, I take, take, and I thought here I might be a little bit better. C7 and g4. Mm -hmm. Because still the rook on c7 is passive, and yeah, you can he's a try bit passive, and I can push here a bit, and it's slight. Probably he should be able to to make a draw, but it's. A little bit unpleasant, I guess. I mean, this is usually the position you want to have with white. You are just pushing, you are playing for two results. Either you make a draw, or maybe black will, after one hour, one hour and a half playing, <laughs> make an inaccuracy and you can you can even win. Yeah. So, but I think he played quite accurate. He played bishop b6. Okay, I don't see anything else than rook d7. I mean, if I start from bishop h6, he takes here, goes rook d8. And okay, next he plays f6 and uh, and king f7. So that's why I played rook d7. Okay, he took took rook c8. Yeah, I think bishop h6 is the only move basically because otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, to try to keep the king boxed in. Mm -hmm. But here he has bishop c5, quite an important move because after in if you would play e6, then he can never um, um, untangle his pieces, and I think here he's very passive. And I don't know if the rook is kind of tied to yeah. the back rank. We have to know that uh, maybe for some uh, weaker players, let's say if they want to go and attack the pawns here, uh, yeah. Black has to be careful about getting checkmated because this bishop is very strong uh, defending these squares uh, around the king. Yeah, so I I thought that I had uh, some chances here, but yeah, he played bishop c5. I think that was this was quite accurate. And here I don't see how to how to do anything. I played a4, but I think maybe a6 would have been even more uh, accurate here. So what's the idea of a6? Because well, we are because now bishop mm -hmm. e3 is not a move anymore because. The the rook is not anymore attacking the pawn, and well, if I play king f3, he goes f6, and he just wants to play king f7, and bring the king. And finally, the king has some freedom to get away from those mating yes. uh, nets. Yes, and um, yeah, I don't see how I can uh, how I can do anything here. Mm -hmm. he, br he brings the king, and it it should be a draw. So he played f6. I think bishop e3 was good. He took, took. Okay, if he plays a6 here, I can take. He goes rook c4, I go rook e6, he takes, I take on f6. And here I might have some chances because if he plays, let's say, a5, I move the rook here. Let's say he moves the rook, I can uh, cut the king on the from the seventh rank. And if he pushes this pawn, maybe I can bring my king in front of my pawns and it's not so easy I think because I because I go with my king and he can he can he can always win one pawn but I always keep one mm -hmm. so and suddenly compared to your game you are kind of very happy that this pawn doesn't have any pawns that are blocking it here yeah. and the king and the pawns both can kind of walk and uh, try to uh, try to promote or maybe go for some checkmates on the back rank yes so I think a5 was uh, good from his side. I played rook d5, rook a8. The king of three is normal, king of seven is normal. I thought e4 is basically the only thing I can do. Because if I bring the king, I don't see how... Um, okay, maybe I could have tried to bring the king, but I thought that... Yeah, he, he also brings the king, so... Mm -hmm. I thought e4 was interesting. Because if he plays, let's say, king e6, I go rook b5, and if he passes rook a7, for example, maybe I can try e5. And if he takes, I go king e4, 
maybe some uh, some chances so again being happy to break through there get some space on the king yeah. side for the king to maybe um, get even to the eight seven pawn yeah I mean uh, just getting rid of my double pawn and yeah I think I can try but I think rook b8 was quite good from him I took on b5 he gave a check I think I have to play e3 because if I go king f2 probably he just plays rook b4 so e3 but okay now my king is a little bit stuck but in this position maybe I should have tried g4 to um, prevent my king from getting completely locked in. So th we are looking at with Eric at this position. We thought it's a, a very good defensive idea for uh, for Vasiv to go rook b8 to sacrifice the pawn, but make sure his rook is active. Yeah. And we wondered if uh, rook goes, let's say, to rook a2, yeah, how rook black is gonna, h how is white gonna get the king out of the uh, the king's uh, Yeah, I, th side. I think I, I cannot get my king out. Um, the only thing I was hoping for is that in some position where I go rook a8 and a7, let me just let me just show it. So if you go, let's say rook a8, and let's say you do reach this pawn, gets all the way to to here. Yeah, maybe at some point I will give up this pawn for one of his pawns on the king side and yeah, try to um, uh, to make use of my extra pawn there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think g4 would have been a better try because if he plays. Um, G, sorry, G. F wait, how do I? Just go here, G four. Yeah, if he goes G five, I might have E five. Mm -hmm. And point is, if he takes, takes. If he now takes on A four, I think this end game could be quite unpleasant. So that's the transposition you wanted. Yeah. You wanted to still keep the pawn, but maybe this time I'm keeping it on the king side and I'm still trying to uh, to see if I can win with the extra pawn. Yes. And um, okay, if he if he waits with rook a2, I go h4, and yeah, if he goes rook, uh, well there was another line like after e5, he goes rook a2, I take take and I give a check. And okay, if he goes, okay, maybe if he goes to e6, I play h3. So after rook h2, I can take here. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe People he just so. plays h6, and it it must be a draw. Okay, um, so um, so what happened? So let's get the mouse here. So it looked like you 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 happen to have this position. Probably um, there is nothing else to do in this final position, right? Yeah, the only thing he has to watch out for is not to play king g7 in this position, because now I play a7, and I think this is kind of a zugzwang. For example, he plays king uh, h7, and now I have rook f8. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, again, maybe it's still a draw if he plays rook e7, for example. He's But I can maybe, maybe bring the king around. So just to explain Sutsang, it's like when you have disadvantage of a move where you have to play. So in this situation, let's say you play king f7, which would be a very, very big mistake. Black, white can actually move the rook here, yeah. and now black is unable to take the pawn because there will be a skewer here. Yes, exactly. So that's why black would probably have to go to h7, but then lose another pawn and there will be, um, there will be many, uh, many moves el else in this game and a lot of fight. Now I have a question, Benjamin. You won yesterday a very important game. Today you draw the, the leader of your tournament. What are your thoughts about this tournament? Last uh, three games ahead. Um, yeah, I started uh, not so good. Mm -hmm. I started with one, minus one, but yeah, of course, uh, winning yesterday is uh, it's quite important to get back on 50% as uh, soon as possible. Um, also for your mood during the tournament. Mm -hmm. and. Um, well, I was hoping to put some pressure today, but I think Vasiv played uh, quite precise, and well, I hope I, I get some chances in the last three games. Mm -hmm. And last question, how do you motivate yourself when you have maybe not a perfect start, and then you do want to make that point, you want to score, so you have you have a bright future in the tournament, how do you do it? Um, yeah, well, I've never really had problems with motivation, um, so um, yeah, I guess it's just important not to... Uh, get uh, to 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 get your mood uh, down to be too sad mm -hmm. and just keep a 
positive mood and uh, try to keep uh, playing for the win instead of trying to play too safe or whatever. Absolutely. So thank you for the wise words. So remember, always keep your mood up, even if the tournament is not going great. Thank you so much for joining us here. Good thank luck you. for the rest of the games. And we'll, show, we'll take a very short break and then we'll be back with Eric. This August, the best chess players in the world are coming to St. Louis for the Grand Chess Tour. The St. Louis Rapid and Blitz and Sinkfield Cup tournaments will feature the world's best right here in St. Louis. The St. Louis Chess Club is celebrating its 10th anniversary and these tournaments will be a highlight you won't want to miss. For tickets and more information, go to stlouischessclub.org. A moment comes in chess when you need to test yourself at a different level. Chess 24 Premium offers the tools that you need to reach your maximum potential. From hundreds of interactive video lessons to becoming part of the Chess 24 community. You can analyze with friends or coach your students live. You get 24 by 7 coverage of chess news and events. Access to premium analysis and commentary. And the chance to interact with grandmasters and other top players and coaches. Get advice from the best and even challenge them to a battle. Be the best chess player you can be. It's time to level up your game with Chess 24 Premium Membership. There's a weekend vacation, a one tank trip. In a nearby city you won't want to skip. St. Louis is the stop for non-stop fun. So much fun for your family. Infinity plus a ton. There's museums full of art and super fun slides. Upside down concretes, twisty turny rides. Be surprised, be intrigued, be delighted. The World Chess Hall of Fame in St. Louis is nothing you'd expect and everything you love. Three galleries highlight the history, culture, and creativity behind the game. Explore chess in ways you never imagined. It's a one-of-a-kind cultural institution where rare artifacts and world-class art play together. The World Chess Hall of Fame, mind, art, experience. This August, the best chess players in the world are coming to St. Louis for the Grand Chess Tour. The St. Louis Rapid and Blitz and Sinkfield Cup tournaments will feature the world's best right here in St. Louis. The St. Louis Chess Club is celebrating its 10th anniversary, and these tournaments will be a highlight you won't want to miss. For tickets and more information, go to stlouischessclub.org. Welcome back everyone to the 2018 Summer Chess Classic. I'm International Master Eric Rosen, joined by Women's Grandmaster Tatev Abrahamian after a nice victory over Vladimir Bellis. Congratulations, Tatev. Thank you. 
so we were looking at the game and we saw that uh, you got a, a position that really suited your style, especially the, the sharp, aggressive mm -hmm. style in the middle game. Um, take us through the opening. Was this something that you prepared or were expecting? Uh, well, he has played uh, this line several times. So e5, knight b5, d6, e4, there, knight c3, a6, back, bishop e6. And there was a game where his opponent went quickly bishop e3, like I did. Mm -hmm. And he played with bishop g7 and knight g7. And his opponent did the same idea of castle queenside, and then d6 pawn was hanging. And I thought it's an interesting way of playing because. Um, you know, when you're playing g6, bishop g7, it takes too long and d6 becomes a target, so I think it makes sense to immediately try to uh, take that pawn. So he played bishop h6 quickly, so I'm assuming it's something he prepared. Did this catch you off guard? Uh, a little bit, but then I started calculating and I thought, um, like, I get to develop very quickly, d6 becomes a target, I castle, and... So I, I played knight g4, so I played f3, keeping in mind that I might still castle queenside, because if I castle queenside, I think immediately there's queen b6 and f2 hang, because without my dark square bishop, his queen is going to try to dominate, or at least control the dark squares. So you're saying in this line, if you castle queenside, it could be a bit problematic for white? Yeah, because now you know, I don't have that bishop on e3, so I want to make sure um, the queen doesn't get in. Oh, that's very true. So I played f3. I'm not hiding my intentions of right. castling queenside. So castles. It seemed like you could, you got everything you could ask for out of the opening. I mean, safe, safe king and some nice kingside attack. Yeah, I mean, my, I think even uh, castle opposite side pawn on c4. I think my king is fairly safe because um, bec with the pawn hanging on d6, he can never go really b5 because rook d6 the knight hangs and. That's right, and it's common in these structures that d6 is just such a long-term weakness and um, maybe not the best opening choice given what happened to black in the middle game. Well, I think you should have played queen d... Uh, wait, what happened? In the 7, knight c2. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you should castle because... So in this position, uh, castling is maybe a bit too risky. Yeah, I think you should have played queen d8 or, I don't know, maybe queen d8 before instead of knight d7. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Which is not the happiest move to play, just putting your piece back well, on the starting uh, square. My queen g g and g5 also is a question whether it wants to be there or not, right? That is true. So if you can play quickly queen d7, rook d8, because now d6 is not hanging. Yeah, would c5 be possible for white here? Maybe knight d4-ish kind of moves come in. Ah, uh, knight d4 could be a yeah. nice Yeah, and the then knight. if I take then b5, oh, then e5 maybe hangs, I don't know. So maybe some complex deviations to what happened in the game. Maybe h6 now, yeah. h6, queen goes back, knight d4, takes b5. Yeah, no, somewhere. So queen goes back maybe to e3. Yeah, but yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't like this trade at all. I feel like I'm letting my opponent's pieces in. That's very true. I don't want to open so up my king. It's one weakness for white in the, in the center of the board, this d4 square. So let's actually take a look at what happened in the game because it seemed like it was just in your comfort zone. At what point did you feel like you had the advantage? Well, when I played h4, I thought, like, I didn't... Yeah, it's actually funny because after knight d6, uh, sorry, after rook d6, mm -hmm. if we go back, if he goes knight c5, I think I can play in c6 and go before. <laughs> now I'm getting confused. Oh, wow, that's uh, <laughs> simple tactics and your, your king stays safe, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have all wow. these pieces and one bishop is not going to do anything because I can always play queen e3 and my king is going to be safe. Yeah, it's so I think true. here I'm just up a pawn and his king is just kind of alone and he's not going to, because the knight on c6 is hanging, there is no attack with b5 or anything. And even if you play b5, I don't know what your follow up is. Yeah, Even if you play b5, b4, and take on a2, it's just going to take a while, and I just feel like my king is just much safer. And yeah. your, your attack comes much quicker on the king side, too. And I'm too. up a pawn, so I think... And you're up a yeah, pawn, so. so... I just got everything I wanted. It's like you win material, you have the compensation, you have initiative. It seems like everything went right for you in this game. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if... Um, I actually thought maybe I could have taken on d7 and I played knight d5, but I don't think that was necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're, five, yeah. if you're a material, yeah, why, uh, why I, I risk think, it? Yeah, I think my attack is just crushing. Mm -hmm. So already, maybe around this point, you, you felt pretty good about your position. Yeah, here I was just thinking, like, I need to have a crushing way of playing, and I just... Like, I had so many options, I didn't know what to play. Of course, yeah. So let's zoom through, because uh, the finish was pretty nice. I mean, the, the Black King kind of walked all the way across the board. Yeah. I mean, here... It, yeah, because now my bishop gets in the game, so the game is over. Because Queen Bishop then. Yeah, he, he did fight on for <laughs> perhaps a long time, but uh, not too much hope for mm -hmm. Black. And uh, especially around here, it's just uh, 
completely one-sided. And the finish is nice, we should note, uh, after king a4. Is there a force made here for white? Yeah, b3, queen d6, right? Yeah, b3, and the king uh, have the final position with opposition among the kings. Oh, that's true. So, nice finish. Thank so, you. I believe this is your first win of the tournament. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's it been like for you being the lowest seed in the event? How have you been able to maybe cope with not the best, uh, not the best performance, but still a lot of uh, fighting games? Well, I mean, I, I am performing over my rating. I think I'm performing at around 2,500. It's a, it's a very difficult tournament. It's always, um, it's actually very nice to be the lowest seed because the pressure is on your opponent. Um, I think the draws that I've made have been, like I've been on the better side of the game again in my mm -hmm. first round and against uh, Robert yesterday I was on the better side. Uh, my most heartbreaking game was against Camille when I had, and the reason is is because the mistake that I made was so typical of the mistakes that I usually make, which is I mean, what usually upset me. It was not necessary, right? This B five move. Yeah, because you know I already have mm -hmm. built a fortress and it's already a draw. Like he told me, like you know mentally he was ready to make a draw, and then instead of just you know keeping the game the same way, it just had to go for something forcing and try to force the matters and of course um, I forgot that he had a winning opportunity there and I thought I'm just forcing the draw instead of just going back and forth and the game is already draw. So that's what I'm upset about because I feel like this is the kind of mistake I make a lot. Poor but uh, otherwise, you know, playing Grandmaster every round, it, it's really difficult but it's very enjoyable because it's not every day I get to do this. For sure, and do you know who you play tomorrow? Uh, I want to say I'm playing, I'm playing black tomorrow, you want to say I'm playing uh, General John. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that game? He has not lost a, a single game so far this tournament. But he's suffering today, right? Is he suffering? Yeah. I we, thought he was like in the middle game at some point. I saw that he was much. suffering. Um, I played him before. I was white, and it was very like I was on the losing side, and I barely drew. But um, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to be blocked. So I'm sure he's going to try to put some pressure on me. Oh, very nice. I won't keep you any longer, especially towards the end of the tournament. I mean, you have to. I mean get to sleep early, mm -hmm. conserve energy, because especially these later games, they, they are tough. They so, are. best of luck in your, your later rounds. Thank you. And we're going to get back to the analysis here. We do have a result in Group A uh, between Jeffrey Zhang and Sam Sevian. Sam actually managed to win the position in a crazy tactical battle. Um, it's been a while since we last looked at this position. Let's see, uh, let's see how, actually how this game transpired. Going back here, uh, Jeffrey did sack material relatively early, sacking the exchange on the queen side, and it seemed like he just didn't get anything for the material deficit. If we go back to this position after queen f2, it uh, seems like Sam just defended everything, rook d2 and knight d4. Good, uh, good harmony in the center with the rook on d2 hitting the queen, queen on c3, knight on d4, and black's pieces just don't seem coordinated here. Uh, queen h4 was played. And really, it just seemed like a matter of technique for Sam, uh, having the extra material. This knight on a3, we should note, is, uh, is just trapped in the position. And after queen f2, maybe going for some last tricks where uh, white's queen is tied down to defending the knight on d4. Uh, Sam played the very simple queen b2. And after the trade, it seems like it's just a matter of technique. And um, Sam is now in, I believe, clear second place after this victory. Uh, actually tied for second, I'm being told. And with that, I'm joined now by Katerina Msova. Welcome back, Katerina. Thank you. Been Hello, a pretty everyone. exciting day so far. Yes, I think we have amazing games. Uh, we have even decisive results. I'm always happy to see uh, to see decisive results. So what do we go to game Jaro Jerebuk, Rina Jumabaev? I uh, thought it was another game that promises decisive result. This was a game we were looking at earlier, and we should note that both players are playing relatively quickly given that they still have a few more moves to make before move 40. Uh, position seems to be heating up. A few more moves have been played after rook take e7, knight take e7. This brings us to the current position where it seems like white is just up a clean pawn. And another pawn is hanging on h5. This, this looks like white is having no trouble. I think Yaro is having huge advantage here. Yeah, I would not be too happy in, in Black's situation. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't think Yaro has won a game this event. He started off with, uh, with so many draws and then lost a the game, if I'm not mistaken, yesterday. So if he can win this game, maybe he's, uh, he's going to have some momentum going into the final rounds. Yes, and he would be back at 50%. He says that draws are good, so 50% he's happy to be back. 
Um, so we will go back to this to this game. What about Peter Prohaska and Vara Kobian? That's the rook end game. game is a draw. Do they still try to play for win? I think it's the only other game going on in Group A, and I mean we still have to prefer White, given that uh, White just has a better pawn structure. Black having two pawn islands, this rook on a6 being incredibly passive, and completely tied down to defending this pawn on b6. So it's everything to play for as uh, as White in this position. Okay, so let's move on to tournament B. We have the leader. Polish Grandmaster Kamil Dragon playing with Turkish Grandmaster JJ Alimarandi. JJ had some issues there, some problems, some passive bishop. How it looks now? They passed the 40 moves, so they both have extra 30 minutes. Uh, so it looks like now it's when they're going to take a break and think. It's very possible, um, but it seems like White is just making a lot more progress. Uh, we can see that, this, especially this, this F pawn, uh, very stable on F6 in the heart of Black's position. And I mean, it seems like JJ could, could suffer uh, another defeat this tournament. That's true. So what about the last round in tournament B? Josh Friedel against Robert Akasarian. Josh had some problems here as well. Yeah, we were looking at this game earlier and we were very much preferring Black's position. It seems like Black is still for choice, being uh, just up a clean pawn. Again, terrible pawn structure for wh for White, given uh, White has all isolated pawns. These double pawns on the A file, not so impressive. And I'm still waiting for this maneuver from Robert getting the Capablanca Knight. Um, but maybe there's some other potential. Maybe he wants to find a way to attack this weak pawn on g6. Maybe he's considering some idea like knight e6 and knight f4. I agree. I'm just thinking what is a good space, what is, what is a good square for the bishop on d3? Because if the knight gets to d6, I mean, black has everything black can desire. I can't be happy being Josh in this position. It is Robert's move, so if we, uh, if we just maybe ponder here what to play. Actually, knight e6 has been played, uh, and we can see Robert there getting up from his seat. Uh, Josh can't be too happy with this knight about to land on f4, hitting the, the bishop on d3, hitting the pawn on g6. Uh, it might just be a, a matter of technique before Robert can, can scoop up the pawn on g6, maybe put the king on d6. It seems like the momentum's really going for black. Yeah, so I want to say something at least positive for white. I thought that maybe that the black pawns are on light squares, b7, c6, d5. Maybe the bishop can go around. So what if I go bishop b2, I mean rook e2, rook b2 right now, force you to go uh, to defend the pawn. Now you have to pick if you're going to defend it with the knight or with the rook. It's actually a good point. Black does have perhaps this, uh, this undefended pawn on b7. It's one of the only weaknesses for black in the position. And it is a question, how does black defend the pawn? Because uh, a move like knight d8 or rook b8, it doesn't seem that preferable. Yeah, if you play rook b8, I can go rook f2, and now my idea is to go to rook f7 and maybe do some do something there, attack the pawn on g7, or or just stop black for making any advancements. And I'm sure uh, I'm sure Robert would not be happy going for some sort of repetition with the rooks uh, mirroring each other between the b and the f files. Uh, we can see Josh has has played rook to b2, putting the question, how does black actually play for a win here? I absolutely agree. I would like to move on back, maybe do tournament A. But which game? So there's not too many games going on in tournament A. Not sure if we have a graphic, but there are a number of games done this round with Vasif Dar Bailey drawing Benjamin Bach. Um, maybe we don't have a graphic, but we can... I can scroll through. Oh, there's a graphic. Uh, so two pending games uh, with Benjamin Bach drawing Vasif Dar Bailey. Sam Sevian, this is a big game of the round, defeating Jeffrey Zhang, uh, moving into a tie for second place. And Daniel Fridman drawing Alexander Injic. So two games left in Group A between Peter Prohaska against Varakobian and Yaro Zherebuk against Renatu Mabayev. And what about graphics for Group B? There are also many decisive games. We see that Dinara Sadokasova won again Alejandro Ramirez, Sergei Matsinko drew with Andrei Stupokin, and Tatev Abrahamian won again against uh, Vladimir Belos. We had two last game pending. Yeah, it's a good day for the ladies, uh, two decisive games, and it seems like uh, maybe there's some, some energy happening in the, the later stage of the tournament. Maybe, maybe that's the start for them, and tomorrow they will bring more points. 
So let's go back to the game between Camille Dragon and JJ Ali Mirandi, because this is a very important game for the standings in Group B. If Camille can win this game, he'll extend his lead and, um, and, and give JJ his first loss of the tournament. And I like his move Queen A7. We were thinking about attacking the king, maybe pushing the pawn in, pawns in the center. But Camille is like, I'm fine with my pawns. I have advantage on the king side. I'm just going to grab as many pawns as I can on the queen side. I really like this move, Queen A7. Uh, I mean, White's king side, incredibly solid. Everything defended. And meanwhile, OK, two pawns are attacked. Black can't defend both of them. Why not just go pawn grabbing and, and get more material? Black now will have to try to, you know, move. I mean, it's probably lost position, so he will just try to, you know, give everything what he can. So maybe G4 just to try to. I mean, yeah, through. when you're when you're playing black in these positions, there's there's nothing to lose. I mean, you have the disadvantage. You're expected to lose. So the strategy is that you want to make it as crazy as possible. Try and create some complications. Given that, okay, you're down material. And maybe we'll see some potential sacrifices, G4 certainly being a candidate move, just trying to open up more lines on the king side. Uh, but it seems like white could very simply respond with a move like F4. Yeah. So that's why JJ decided to play rook C8. Maybe just let's defend the seventh rank, let's defend the pawn on C7. So he played rook C8, waiting with you know some ideas like G4, and thinking what else can he do here? Yeah, rook C8 seems like a very depressing move. I mean, uh, when you have to move a rook to defend a pawn, which is useless in the position, you're, you probably know that things are going wrong. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if Camille just picks up the free pawn on a6. I mean, why not? And it's still a question, how is black uh, creating any active play in this position? Um, we can imagine that the queen would love to somehow get to a better square. Sometimes when, I, when I'm in positions like this and my pieces are just kind of not on the best squares, I would, I would like to imagine where they're best placed. Um, in this position, I would love to bring the queen somehow to f1, but it seems like it would take many moves. So maybe some idea like queen f7, queen b3, queen d1. At queen f7, we can be very creative here, kind of like a maze trying to get to the, the desired location. Um, of course, if this were bug house, it would be a lot easier to just ask your, your partner for a queen and then uh, maybe black could get some initiative. Yeah, um, it's a very sad position. White is just grabbing most likely another pawn. Black is suffering. Let's move on to a different game. This is too sad. So let's move back to group A because there's some excitement taking place in the battle between Yaro Jerebuk and Renat Jumabayev. Uh, seems like Yaro is on his way to converting the advantage uh, in a pretty pretty nice sacrifice, if I'm not mistaken. If we go back a few moves, uh, the players have reached move 40. Yaro grabbed the free pawn on h5, and after g6, he played the very bold bishop take g6. Is this a peace sacrifice, or is it just uh, is it a winning combination? I mean, it looks like black will recapture the bishop, and then I think another pawn uh, on c6, and then g6 is hanging. I mean, I may end up having five pawns for, for a knight, while we have to keep in mind that the king is so weak, there are no pawns in front of him uh, to defend it, so White has many ideas of actually checkmating the king. This is so painful to look at from, uh, from the black side. I mean, the, the five pawns for the knight is the least of black's worries, while the king is just so naked on g8. Queen g6 would be coming. Queen take g6 check and queen take d5 check, both threats in the position. Uh, maybe we could analyze a few moves further, given that knight e7, perhaps the only logical move and then probably the very simple queen e6 check. We want to get the queen winning. closer to the king. We are attacking the knight as well. Yeah, I mean, just I winning back material. I mean, king f8, just very simply queen f6, king g8, rook take e7. Uh, this should be decisive very soon for Yaro. This can maybe this can, can be over very soon. So last game we didn't look at, or we did, but not too much. Uh, Peter Prohaska and Varak Obian. Yeah, maybe we can spend a bit more time here trying to figure out if White has anything to play for in the game, given that VAR is, the, uh, is in close behind. I believe he's currently tied with Sam Sevian for second place in Group A. And if VAR loses this game, that could really, uh, really allow Vasif to, to run away with, uh, with the tournament lead. But I don't really see a plan how to, how to advance here. I mean, how do you want to create anything here for... Uh, for white. Maybe you want to defend the pawn on d3 coming back with king e2 and forcing the black rook on d5 to go into passive square on d6. 
No, that's very true, especially with the last move, e3, both, uh, both of these ideas, king e2, but also this just very simple move, pawn d4, uh, creating kind of the, the mini pawn chain for white could be a, a stabilizing uh, idea. And meanwhile, white does want to consider just grabbing the pawn on b6. I'm a little bit curious, Peter was able to just grab the pawn right here with a move like rook take b6, but I'm wondering if he thought this line wouldn't give him enough winning chances. Yes, I mean, rook endgames, pawn up, does not always mean that the endgame is going to be won. So Grandmasters probably understood that black has many chances to defend this position, so Peter wants to maybe make extra weaknesses and get extra advantage before grabbing that pawn. I think this is a very good practical situation because, I mean, at Grandmaster level, these uh, these three versus four positions, they typically end with a, with a draw. Um, but maybe if you're Magnus Carlsen, maybe you can grind it out. Uh, so I think Peter made a good decision delaying capturing the weak pawn on b6, maybe trying to make some improving moves, get far low on time, and then when the moment is right, take the pawn later when VAR has less time to actually calculate. So what do you think? Let's move on to a different game, or do you want to stay here a little longer? Um, we can maybe stay here just a bit longer. We see that, uh, that VAR is thinking in the position. Both players silhouetted there on... Uh, on the video, um, yeah, he, I mean, VAR is notorious for getting low, low on time, and in this game, he could, uh, he could exhaust all his time given that there's only one moment where you get more time in the game. Um, so I'm wondering, does, does Black just have to wait here, or is there any, any way of maybe simplifying the position for Black? I mean, I also want to know that they started to play at 1 p.m., so it's soon going to be four hours of playing. So black is very tired, so maybe white want to take advantage of that and really try to push for something and make VAR tired even more and maybe force him to make uh, inaccuracies. That's a good point. We do have one more move played. Uh, somewhat unexpected move, rook a2, but maybe it's very logical. Uh, making the worst, one of the most passive pieces ever on a6, a much more active piece on the second rank, uh, completely forgetting about the pawn. And if we imagine that, uh, that white takes the pawn, maybe black has some idea of coordinating the rooks, perhaps rook c5 and rook c2. And we might see this three on four scenario, which could be a very long grinding game. I agree. Another idea can be instead of rook c5, rook c2, maybe we can play rook d2 and force the d-pawn to even push more. Uh, and then we have some chances of even exchanging it by playing e5. But I, I wouldn't want to play this position for black. Being pawned down and suffering, that's always difficult for the, for the side that has the, the less material. Uh, that's a very good point. I think uh, Vara is going to have to undergo some, some long, uh, long torture through this game if he wants to hold on for the half points. But that's what, that's what grandmasters do or have to do. Sometimes they have to defend worse end games. And because there's so much, so much money on the line given the tournament situation, I know VAR is, is going to be fighting until, uh, until every last move in this game. I would like to move on to the Josh Friedel game against uh, Robert Agasarian. The rook is moving to b2 to h2, trying to create some, um, some active space. So what do, you, what, what do we think about this? Yeah, when we last left, we saw the move rook b2 played, hitting the pawn on, on uh, b7. And I'm pretty sure that Robert probably turned down this rook b8 move because of your idea of rook f2. So that's why he opted for maybe the more solid knight d8. But it's a little bit slow. And as the game continued, rook h2, king d6, it's still a question for, for black how to activate the knight and keep the pawn on b7 defended. Um, but for the time being, it seems like white just has to wait around and, and black is having all the fun. Yes, so not much is happening in these games. Players have a lot of time. Uh, so we would like maybe to promote the Rapid and Blitz tournament that's ahead of us. That's a good point. Uh, for the second year in a row, we have two very exciting events in August. From August, 6th, from August 9th through the 16th, we have the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz uh, second edition. And I know last year was very exciting. I was actually here in St. Louis. Kasparov came out of retirement for the event. Um, I don't think he's returning this year, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of strong players. And we also have the Sinkfield Cup coming up. 
That's an amazing tournament, I think. I always enjoy watching the commentary, watching the players. I was here actually three times for the Singfield Cup. It's amazing how the, how the chess scene here just changes with so many strong grandmasters being here. No, it's incredible. Like you're, you walk down the central west end and you, you throw a rock and you, you hit a, a grandmaster rated over 2700. So it's just a, a, such an incredible uh, experience just being here in person. And I'm sure there, there will be a lot of people traveling from all over the country, if not all over the world, to watch the event. And it's totally worth it. I think they always play amazing games. And it's just great to see these players uh, fight against each other. It's true. Um, I do want to go back and show uh, a moment from earlier today. Uh, it was actually the first game that finished, but I think we should at least go back and, and give the viewers some, some instructive moments from that game. Uh, do you happen to know which game I, I might be referring to? Do you mean Dinara Sadovacasova against Alejandro Ramirez? That's, uh, that's very true. It was um, maybe not Alejandro's best day at the office. Going down very quickly, almost a miniature losing in, uh, in just over 25 moves. Um, and I do want to show the game, given that Dinara uh, seemed very well prepared in the opening and she was able to seize initiative from very early on. Um, so Alejandro played his uh, maybe somewhat expected e6, b6. We saw him play this earlier in the tournament with not great success against Vladimir Bellis. And it's very interesting that this opening started as a very peaceful game and suddenly, I mean, the, the game was over in, in less than 30 moves. That's true and Danara showed no fear, just uh, going for the, the pretty early central expansion if we see this pawn move, pawn d5, completely blocking out the bishop on b7 and after c5 was played she expanded even further with f4. Um, now I do want to zoom forward to the very instructive moment after knight g6 was played. She unleashed a, a really powerful and, and very aesthetic idea here, given that she has so much space in the center. Why not expand even further? And why not target one of Black's biggest weaknesses in the position, uh, this pawn on e6? She played the beautiful move pawn f5, which maybe you don't see every day, uh, such pawn structure from so early on in the opening. And it looks like, um, so Alejandro took on f5, so if white recaptures pawn takes f5, the knight has amazing square on e5 and black has nothing to worry about, but Dinara had an amazing idea that does not block this position. Yeah, she played maybe a, a nice subtle pawn sacrifice, pawn e5, with the very direct tactical idea of, uh, of winning the queen, just threatening bishop take f5. Uh, so we really have to admire Dinara's tactical resourcefulness in, in this line. Uh, the game continued pretty uh, in a pretty ugly manner for Alejandro, needing to get the king to a safer place. King BA played, but after bishop take f5, white just keeps initiative and, uh, and white won material in just a few more moves. Yeah, I don't know how much time we want to spend on this game knowing that Alejandro, he's home here, this is even his studio almost. So let's just quickly see what happened yeah, in I'm the sure game. I'm sure Alejandro will not be uh, happy us reviewing it, but it, it is a very instructive moment for, for all those watching, seeing how a very strong Grandmaster can go down with what seemed like not much of a fight. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, when we see the, the bishop on b7, the knight on a5, those, those pieces are just out of the game. Oh, they don't have true. any future. And we did interview Alejandro after his win over Vladimir Bellas a few days ago, and uh, he said he, he kind of forgot how to play chess that game. I wonder if this game was no different. And of course, in this game, he, he was severely punished for it. I mean, it must be also very difficult for him. He's a coach, he's a player, he's working here at a chess club. He has so many chess responsibilities. So just being an active player, it may be a very difficult uh, situation to really be able to play your get best game every single game. That's true, but uh, I mean, that's the thing about being a, a high level chess player. I mean, this happens to everyone. Everyone has rough days where you don't play your best chess. Um, I'm sure, I mean, it's happened to me many times. I'm sure it's happened to you. How do you deal with a game like this? How do you bounce back for the, the later rounds? Yeah, I liked what Benjamin Brock was suggesting in my interview. I was asking him even like how, you know, how to keep your mood up when you are not having a great tournament. 
and he was just like, you just have to, you just have to have your mood up so um, you can play well. So I think that's a very good message. That's what I also try to uh, to do in my games. My games thinking like, okay, maybe this is not the best game. I have to move on. Tomorrow is the next day, a new game. I, I just have to perform well. No, that's very true. I think it's a matter of discipline, but it's also a matter of mindset where you don't necessarily want to be too worried on the result. I mean, as a, as a chess player, as a, a high level uh, chess competitor, you want to be thinking long term and you want to be uh, thinking about how you'll develop over the coming months and years. And one event, of course, is not the end of the world. So I agree. So what if we go back to the game? Jaro Zerbuk is still playing against Rina Jumabaev, so the game is not yet over. Did we miss something or is it going to be over soon? Looks like Black got some type of counterplay. Uh, we may have overlooked a move. Yeah, after Queen takes e6, uh, I was expecting the very passive knight e7, but Renat went for the much more active rook e2. But after king f3, it doesn't seem too promising for Black, given that both the knight, the rook, not to mention the pawn on g6, are all undefended. It just seems pretty much over for, for, uh, for Black in this position. Yeah, this is a very difficult situation. We see the knight, it's extra knight, uh, but, oh, he's not, he just played rook e3. Is there any chance for some kind of perpetual yeah, rook check? Rook e3 does, uh, it, it is one more check, but after king f2, I think black is out of checks. Um, though he did play another move, rook e2. Is this some sort of desperation, or is there a, a plan behind, behind it? I mean, can white just simply take the rook? So then probably the only move is just queen e8, just hoping to create a cooperation between the knight and queen. But we can have anything. We can play even king f1. I think this is just desperate. And this is what's being played out. Queen e8 was played. And I do like the, uh, the very safe king f1. Uh, there would be one more check in the position, 93. But after king g, g1, it just seems over for... Uh, for uh, Oh, is it is it already over? No, he's still thinking, but um, no, it's going to be over for Renat very soon. So before we wrap it up, let's have a last glance at the game of uh, Camille Dragon and JJ Ali Marandi. Is that game over, or is there a chance for Black to defend? I mean, JJ is still under very serious pressure. Uh, Camille Dragon expanding even further. Rook G H just played. Uh, oh, we see Mike Hummer there putting the kings in the center of the board. Uh, looks like Yarrow has, uh, has officially won his game. Uh, first victory of the tournament for Yarrow Zerbuk. And again, very good return. Yesterday he has had first loss, today he, he has first win. So it's great to see how he just got back to the tournament. So maybe we can have uh, pairings for tomorrow or standings. What is happening in the tournament? Hey, we have many results already. Actually, we're going to hold off on that for a moment. and. Uh, wait for the graphic to be prepared. But let's let's take a look at this game because uh, after rook g8, black is maybe employing the, the cocoon mechanism. He's just trying to hold on uh, for dear life as white continues to expand. Um, and we see this very, uh, very aesthetic move just played, pawn f5, uh, cementing, oops, cementing the very beautiful pawn chain all on light squares, restricting the black bishop on d7. Uh, doesn't seem too pretty for black. Yeah, let's let, let's not spend there too much time. Now I have an information that the graphic is ready. So let's see what is the what is the standing of uh, Group A. Right, we have Vasif Dorbeli maintaining his lead, and the Verusian Akobian game is still going on. If Verusian can hold a draw, he'll be only a half point behind first place. But if Peter Verhaska comes through with a win. Uh, then Vasif will be leading the tournament by a full point. Mm -hmm. So what about pairings for tomorrow for Group A? Oh, there is a correction in that graphic, which Renat did lose his game. But let's take a look at pairings for tomorrow. Alexander Injic against Benjamin Bach. Jeffrey Zhang against Daniel Fridman. Renat Jumabayev against Sam Sevian, who is making a comeback and, and fighting for, for some of the top places. Of course, we also have Verusia Nikobian against Yaro Zerubuk. And tournament leader Vasif Dorbeli playing his Webster teammate, Peter, Peter Prohaska. I'm wondering if that's going to be a, a hard fought game or maybe a, a peaceful draw. And it's going to be curious, especially to see how Peter plays today with Dvar, because if Peter is able to win that Rugen game, uh, then he's ready to, to be, you know, to try to win against Vasif. So. 
Uh, it's very see. true. It's all about momentum. And if you can have maybe a, maybe a lucky win, it can give you some energy and motivation going forward in the tournament. So let's see the tournament B. What, if, what is the standing there? Yeah, we still have a couple games still pending. Camille Dragon leading the tournament. If he, uh, if he draws or wins his game, he'll be still in clear first. And of course, uh, not still not the best tournament for Vladimir Bellis, uh, losing to Tatev Avrahamian today. Very, very difficult tournament, very difficult start for him. Three more rounds to go. Well, let's see how he's going to do. So let's see what is the pairings for tomorrow. We have Robert Agasarian against Dinara Saduakasova, Vladimir Bellos against Josh Friedel, JJ Alimarandi playing with Tatev Abrahamiam, Andrei Stukopin against Kamil Dragon, and Alejandro Ramirez against Sergei Matsenko. Especially in the later rounds, sometimes we'll, we'll see players get tired. We might have to expect more blunders, um, but certainly a lots, uh, lots more exciting chess ahead of us. I'm really happy with this tournament, seeing so many uh, very, really interesting games. A lot of tactics, even positional end games. I see how players are happy to have their spotlight, to have nice tournament, great prize, and I think all of them are enjoying this tournament. That's right. I'm enjoying it myself, just watching the games. Lots of excitement, and I'm sure there's a lot more excitement to come. Uh, join us tomorrow. Round 7 starts at 1 p.m., and you can follow all the games live on uschesschamps.com. Uh, looking forward to another exciting day of chess. See you tomorrow. This has been a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club.